Okay. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. J. That's fun to say. Welcome back. <laughs> so glad to be back. Thanks for having me on. It was a blast last time talking to you guys. And I think that this one is going to be just as much fun, if not more fun. Yeah, we think so too. <laughs> so when we had you on last fall, we discussed all the popular HRV myths, and we really took a deep dive on into what HRV actually is, which I think most people are still very confused about. So you mentioned before we started recording, you're going to continue to beat your drums, which we appreciate. Indeed. Um, and we're also really excited about the launch of Hanu Health because now we have some potent strategies to not only measure, but also optimize our HRV. So we're really excited to drop into this tech, but I think to kick this off, I think it's worth revisiting the very most common and relentless misconception that we can compare our HRV scores. So can you kick us off, explain why we cannot use this as like a normative, I think you call it normative comparative piece of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Always a great topic of discussion because, you know, I've done, you know, the Hanu health podcast we've had going now for close to four months or so. And people write in questions all the time for our Q and a, and then I get emails all the time, both from my prior clinic that I ran my consulting clinic. And then also with, within Hanu people are always, they, it's like, I can, I predict the emails I'm going to get every single week. It's like, what do I do about my open quote, low HRV, end quote, like all the time. So it's like this notion that people still have of like having a low HRV. And it's not to say that you can't have a low HRV. We all can have a low HRV, but what does that mean? Is it low compared to, you know, my brother or my neighbor next door? Is it low compared to myself? Like what does low mean? So it's all back to this whole concept or this notion that HRV should not be compared to anyone else other than yourself. So if somebody is going to write me or and say, I have a low HRV, or if they come to you, Lauren, or you Renee and say like, can you help me with my low HRV? Well, we need to take a step back and ask, well, what does that mean when we say low? And for most individuals, they're just going to say, well, you know, I think that because my aura ring is reading, you know, 20 milliseconds every single morning, like that's low. Well, maybe if it could be low, if your average, let's say is 30 and you've been consistently getting, you know, tw you know, 10 milliseconds below, then that could be low for you. But that doesn't mean um, that you should be taking that number that you have in front of you and then saying, I'm saying it's low because I've seen other people, you know, have scores that are 50, 100, 150, because that, that level of comparisons there. And the reason I think this happens so often, honestly, is because on so many other biometrics, on so many other measurements, period, like we do have the ability to kind of compare to others. So, you know, we think of things, horrible example here because it's a horrible metric, but BMI is one of them. So there's like a normative value set of BMI. There's a normative value set of blood pressure. There's a normative value set of a lot of like cholesterol. These are all things that can fall into normative sets. And so when people kind of use their, you know, brain's heuristic of comparison, well, it's like, oh, well, if we compare on all of these other metrics, then we probably compare on HRV as well. And it's not the case. And the reason just to kind of back up even further is because there are so many things that can confound or confounding variables is what we call them in research. These are kind of like things that impact um, out of our conscious awareness and ability to control HRV. And these are things like genetics, basic demographics, height, weight, gender, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness is a huge one. And that's actually one way to really boost and improve overall baseline HRV. But I think that that is what leads to the confusion. So when we say low, low is always relative and low is always relative to self. And so we can talk about kind of like how to find that, uh, because I think that for many people, they're like, okay, when, once they get that concept and they're like, okay, I'm not comparing to others. Great. So how do I compare to self? Uh, until recently, there hasn't been a lot of great ways to do it unless you're, you know, you're a data scientist nerd like myself or a researcher who knows how to put it within a framework. But um, with what we've created at Hanu, my shameless first plug of I'm sure many is going to put you within a frame, a normative reference frame. So, you know, when you fall outside of your normal range and when you're inside your normal range and then when you're above it. So uh, in, in an effort not to go into too long of a diatribe and and talk. Um, that's, that's kind of my initial answer is that like, it, we just have to 
really take a step back and look at the framework of two different things. Number one, in the HRV space, normal is better, not high is better necessarily, um, and, and low is relative and relative to the self. Okay, so in range for you, I guess I just want to clarify, like I'm thinking about lab biomarkers that you brought up where we have the normative values, like when we look at lipids, whether it's a standard or a functional range, we know, you know, everyone should fall kind of between this number and that number. HRV is different because it's affected more on a short short term basis, like it fluctuates more quickly. Is that why it's really different? Yeah, it's a great question. It fluctuates much more quickly, and that's because it's an extremely sensitive measurement. Uh, it's sensitive to so many different things, both internally and externally. So when I say sensitive, um, you know, in an effort to change heart rate variability, um, it doesn't take much, and it's very similar to heart rate. So a question that I get all the time is, is like, can we use heart rate as a basis of normative comparison? And the answer is, Yes and no. So it's like a kind of answer. So it, we can use different age normative ranges, gender normative ranges for heart rate, but heart rate is not nearly as sensitive of a metric as HRV. HRV changes very quickly and it can change in to response to so many things. It could be breathing, it could be environmental temperature. So right now in my office here, um, they decided, I guess, within my complex not to like have the air conditioning running today. And so it's a little bit warm. So that increased in body temperature is naturally going to uh, decrease HRV. So what's interesting about that is like, should I then interpret that as like, uh oh, my HRV's dropped. So like, am I stressed? Is my body stressed? Well, kind of, but then also kind of not. Like, how significantly is that impacting me? Not that much. Like, it's not affecting mental acuity that much. I mean, it might be a little bit. Uh, uncomfortable, but for the most part, it's not significantly impacting it. Whereas like I could be in the middle of a meeting um, and the temperature is great, but it's the stress of like dealing with the meeting or talking or all these other things that are going on within my environment that are driving HRV. Another one I just mentioned was talking. The simple fact of just talking changes HRV. Is me talking mean I'm stressed and that my nervous system is being significantly impacted by that stress? Not necessarily. So you can see that there's so many things that impact heart rate variability that then to compare it to the impact of other things to other people, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why we say that heart rate variability tends to just live on its own in terms of self-comparison. There's other metrics that are self-comparison based, but this is certainly one that I would say is, is absolutely within the framework of like, it has to be relative to self simply because it's sensitive and it is confounded by basically everything. Yeah. I, I always remember back to when I did your HRV course, you explained like the percentage in your trends. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk about that because I know even Lauren and I are, and probably you too, Dr. J are guilty of, we share our aura ring data or biostrap data and people are like, oh my gosh, your HRV, I want to be like that. And I'm not sharing it to like show off that number. It's just like, oh, overall. Yeah, right. You're, you're giving a flex. Come yeah. on. <laughs> but Such I don't want to make, people, make people feel bad. Yeah, humble brag. <laughs> right. um, well, actually, so two questions actually on that. So number one is what is the biggest factor in your baseline HRV? Because like Lauren and I, we're related. Our average HRV is pretty close. Mm -hmm. Is that coincidence? Is it the genetics? That's my first question. Yeah. Then I'm going to circle back to my other question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let me answer that one. So genetics plays an extremely strong um, component is a sh extremely strong component. So we see this in multiple research-based studies where, uh, where they've done twin studies and, and sibling studies as well. And they've seen that regardless of overall health status, HRV is typically within the same range. Now, what's really interesting is that baseline range for these individuals, regardless of health status is pretty close to one another. Now there are exceptions, especially if someone's extremely cardiorespiratory, uh, has a high level of cardiorespiratory fitness compared to the other sibling or twin. You just don't see it happen super often. I mean, a lot of that is behavioral. A lot of that is learned. Um, you know, a lot of times kind of, we do a lot of the things that our family does. So there's, there's a lot of connection there, but what is, what was the strongest correlation was psychological stress and the impact that stress had on the individual. And then how well were they to engage? How, how, um, 
uh, able were they to engage in autonomic control, which is basically controlling the nervous system through different mechanisms, predominantly the slowing of breathing or slowing of respiratory rate. And we saw that individuals who practiced that or individuals who had better autonomic control were able to modulate HRV at a much faster rate and do it more potently and engage in raising HRV quicker than their sibling or their twin. Uh, however, baseline stayed the same. So genetics is really, really strong component and we have to factor that in. And then, you know, there's other things too that I mentioned. I am at a distinct advantage, which we don't know exactly why this is, uh, but height. So I'm six foot five. I'm a really tall guy and taller people have a lower respiratory rate typically. And then we also have a higher HRV. So mine is already typically inflated. I've, I, I will mention one last thing too, and then we can circle to your next question is that, um, and I'm just going to you know, cross my fingers, hope and pray that my dad doesn't listen to this, but he's typically in my, I, I would, I would say that he's probably considered by many and maybe self-proclaimed by himself to not be the healthiest individual in the world at times. He kind of goes through cyclical bouts. Uh, he has a naturally high HRV and it's not too far away from mine, which is a naturally high HRV. So it's just one of those things that we have to consider. And maybe that was why I was drawn into the world of HRV is because I have a naturally high HRV. So I'm like, woohoo, look at me, I win, but I don't really win. And that's the thing, right? Is like what we, what is really the determinant of winning in the field of HRV is our ability to engage in autonomic control and change HRV at will whenever we want to, because that means we have good control of our nervous system. Yeah. Well, I will say Lauren and I don't really have the height factor on our side. So at five <laughs> point two not. over here, <laughs> maybe that's why oh, I, got a, I got a few inches on you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. She's a little bit taller. Um, right. I actually don't remember what my previous question was going to be, but something you just said reminded me. So we saw Dr. Patrick mm -hmm. Porter over the weekend at biohacking Congress. And he was talking about how, you know, it's not the stress itself that's aging us and causing chronic illness. It's how we perceive the stress. And I think for a while we were just thinking like, that's all in our head. Oh, that doesn't stress me out. So it's not a problem, but is it actually this nervous system control that is causing that? How, yeah. how we perceive stress? Yeah. Great question. Think? So there, what we know is that physiology and psychology, or we can say stress and from the psychological perspective, these are interconnected. This is a bi-directional two-way street. And so with that, we know that they're kind of communicating back and forth. So we listen to cues, our brain listens to cues from our body. So our autonomic nervous system and central nervous system are always communicating. And when our body experiences stress, and that could be physiological exertion, or we like engage in stress, like exercise, or we experience something within our environment that causes our body to go on guard uh, to kind of prevent ourselves from getting chased and eaten by the mountain lion, if you will. And that then sends a signal to our brain and cognition or thought then occurs. So we see that, that kind of one way street, but we on the other side, which makes it a two way street is that cognition can affect physiology just the same way. So we're in kind of a situation and our mind starts wandering and going and thinking about all the things that we have on our to-do list or our task list that we haven't yet gotten done or accomplished. And the next thing we know, we're sweating, we have a high heart rate, HRV drops. So these are very much interconnected. And a lot of it comes down to, again, perception. And you know what's interesting is that we all are going to have these natural, innate, physiological and psychological responses to stress when we encounter them. But a lot of it too, I think there's kind of two components that I hope in on. One is mindful awareness, right? So it's mindful awareness of when that is occurring, because a lot of the times people aren't being mindfully aware of when it's occurring. And so it builds up, it compounds. The next thing they know, if they were to look back at heart rate or heart rate variability data for the last four hours, man, it was in the gutter. Like it was awful, but they were so kind of disengaged from cognition that they didn't notice kind of like all the damage that was being done. They had no perception of what, and what, was going on. Whereas I like this idea of being mindfully aware of when we are experiencing those physiological and psychological symptoms so that we can then acknowledge it and then do something about it. We can train resiliency that way. So I think that what it boils down to in the end is that perception is kind of key, but self-awareness and self-monitoring is probably the largest component here. And then afterwards, you've got to self-regulate because if we notice something, but we don't do anything about it, 
eh, I mean, what's, what's good about noticing it? It might even be more damaging to notice it and not, to, not do anything about it because then you're kind of a continuing to mull it over in your mind. So, I mean, again, and this goes back to like in the state of what I do, especially as a clinician is that I train the two components of self-awareness and perception of stress and mindful awareness of stress, but then also to the self-regulation components. And like, that's kind of a huge problem that we have in the stress field. I would say in the wearable field too, right? It's because you can get all this great information and data, but if you don't actually do anything about it or have any useful practical tools, the, the information might even be more damaging than just not knowing. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. Yeah. I'm experiencing that right now with clients. We're like information overload and it's amazing to have these tools, but it does actually seem like it's more detrimental than not knowing at this point um, and, and kind of causing that stress response, like you mm -hmm. said. What you said before almost sounds like a false sense of resilience. Like it's, we're really, um, you know, we're wired for survival. So we can survive and sort of ignore stress just to get through the day, but it's not necessarily thriving. So what is like from a biometric standpoint, what's real resilience versus this state of, you know, not awareness, not being in awareness, mm -hmm. ignoring the stress. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think what we're really good at from a, like what we're really good at as humans is talking ourselves out of things and trying to convince <laughs> ourselves otherwise. Right. So yeah. I'm really good at saying, I'm good. I'm not stressed. I'm not sore. Let me go get this workout in that I probably shouldn't be doing. Like I'm really good at talking myself out of things. And we know that individuals who have a little bit more high level of neuroticism type a, uh, I'm speaking really to myself right now because I just can be so yeah. neurotic with things. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like really good at being like, you know, shut up, you baby, like just push through, like, just go, just go, go, go. And the next thing I know I'm burnt out. And I'm like, dude, in retrospect, I could have looked back and caught this like months ago when I was burning out months ago. And now I'm like nothing. I've imploded. Like what's going on here. And it comes down to this kind of whole notion of just like us, like, knowing, but then choosing not to know. So it's like, we have the information that's presented to us. Like we kind of see it, but we're like, eh, eh, nope, don't have time for it. Bottle it up, throw it behind us. And the next thing we know, you know, it's like pushing a bunch of air into a two liter bottle at some point, like it's going to blow. Um, and yeah. you know, that can, that can actually be like us legitimately like exploding on other people and like being emotionally volatile and very reactive to certain situations. So I think, yeah, in the end, it comes down to this notion that like, we have to be more self-aware and we have to continuously check in. And so like you asked, you know, how can we look at this from like a biometric standpoint? Well, like a lot of people, if they don't acknowledge kind of like their own subjective self-report of their stress or their anxiety or their anger or whatever, you know, emotion you fill the, fill the blank in, then what I've thought is, is, well, what if we had something that could be there as like an alert system, something that's kind of like monitoring the system at all times acts as a radar. And that's really where Hanu came from is kind of this idea of like, let's monitor all these biometrics of the human stress response throughout the day so that we can help people to become more alert alert, more aware of when they're experiencing stress. But then instead of just alerting and saying like, okay, like now I'm just letting you know, good luck, like have fun. We're actually going to give you something that works. And that's something that has been proven over and over and over again in the literature to be an effective means of helping you to engage in autonomic control. And the spoiler is, is that, I mean, it's, it's biofeedback and breath work. I mean, it's something so simple that's accessible and it's not, you know, something that is over people's head in terms of like woo woo um, because you know and again it's not to throw any other like companies or products under the bus is that some people have a hard time like seeing the effect of something like if they don't buy in and have trust in it um, or if they feel like eh, like I, maybe it works maybe it doesn't where it's like if you tell somebody let's just slow breathing down almost everybody i've ever met who slows breathing down will say yeah that feels good so at least subjectively you know it feels good and then you get some objective data that then shows oh yeah there was some changes in the nervous system that reinforces behavior you don't need the data but what it's it's good. It's an accountability, right? You see it and you say, man, yeah, I not only do I feel good, but man, I see the data change. And that reinforces that this thing's doing what it says it's doing, uh, which is your body doing what it should do, <laughs> regulating itself. And it's really as simple as that. 
Yeah. yeah and then you get behavioral change with that. Mm-hmm. So would you yep. say that's the biggest difference with Hanu compared to other trackers? I mean, most trackers for HRV are doing overnight data. Hanu, mm-hmm. can you explain is doing all day? Yeah. yeah, throughout yeah. The day? So you got it. So uh, the great thing about wearable technologies that we have accessible to many individuals, especially a lot of your listeners, and we were talking about things like, it's funny, I've got them on like six devices right now, uh, like Aura Ring, Whoop, yeah, BioStrap, <laughs> um, Hanu, which is on my arm. I had a polar chest strap on. I've got a Garmin on here for, you know, fitness. Yeah. All of them. Well, in. I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. I know. And that's it. So all of these have great abilities to monitor HRV, uh, but they do so when you're at rest and particularly when you're at really big time rest, like sleep. Uh, and, and that's good. Like that's really helpful as a good uh, baseline for recovery, looking at repair of the autonomic nervous system. Um, it's a good kind of primer readiness type of, of, of metric. So I don't discredit that. Actually, I really like the idea of continuing to measure at a very static tonic type state, which would be when we're asleep. However, One of the problems is, is that when it comes to stress, um, most people, unless they're experiencing something like post-traumatic stress disorder or some other really heavy anxiety disorder that will manifest heavy at night, like in dreams, nightmares, and so forth, a lot of people, yes, from a recovery standpoint, it can be helpful, but from a psychological stress perspective, a lot of people are at their least stressed point in time when they're asleep. It's actually during the daytime when the mind is going, when cognition is flying like crazy, that they're more likely to experience stress or at least manifest. And so what we thought within Hanu is, okay, how can we create something that is continuously monitoring the human stress response? And it's not just monitoring HRV. And that's one thing to kind of clarify too. Like it's a really aggregate composite of looking at different biometrics of the human stress response. And that includes HRV, obviously, but it also monitors heart rates and it's very sensitive to heart rate, a much different way of measuring heart rate. And then the third thing is respiratory rate. So we know that we can watch people's breathing rate. And as they increase their respiration rate, that's actually much more indicative of a removal of the vagal break and maybe potentially more sympathetic nervous system activation. So we're doing it continuously all throughout the day. So I say that Hanu operates very differently because it's a continuous all day stress monitor and like a stress radar. And then it operates as a stress coach, which is, I think probably the best aspect of Hanu, the monitoring, the data is great, but the stress coaching kind of that individual like therapist, that's like on your, like, uh, you know, on your body at all times, which sounds a little bit odd now that I say it out loud. Exactly. Yeah. It, that, it can, that can be so incredibly valuable and helpful to people. So again, our whole goal at Hanu is to number one, be extremely stress focused. Like we are hardcore focused on stress and helping you to be more resilient to stress. Uh, The second thing that we're really, really, really trying to do is help you to be your own coach. And what I mean by that is that I really want people to not just rely on this type of mechanism for, you know, enhancing their resiliency to stress, but what I really want them to focus on is like creating new habits so that they automatically kick into high gear when they need it. And like, if they didn't have Hanu on that day, like it's almost as if they did have Hanu on that day, because the more and more we wear the device and and me as well, I mean, I'm already wearing it all day, every day Um, as, as a co-founder of the company, I probably should be doing that. But for me, like I found that when I'm not wearing it on those days, like I'm on the weekend, I'm like, okay, I'll take a break. I don't need to be looking at my phone all day because that's what I typically do. Cause I'm always looking for bugs and trying to fix things. Um, uh, I find that I'm better aware of when my heart rates kind of getting a little bit amped up, which is very indicative of the stress response being engaged, but I'm also just like pacing my breath throughout the day. I'm just kind of noticing my breath more often. So if we can enhance better mind body awareness with this device and just have people start to become their own biofeedback machines and then use Hanu as like an accountability partner, if they will. Like, I think that's a the mission's been accomplished there. Oh yeah. I mean, you're filling the void on like this huge gap because like you said, we have all these things that measure HRV overnight. And then we have all these gadgets that we can wear to supposedly increase HRV, but no one's really seeing, at least I'm not seeing it in the data. Um, <sighs> so you're filling the gap there. And 
I will personally say I did try the leaf device. I did like the eight weeks. I learned that from you. And yeah. I learned that the 10 minutes before I podcast, my HRV drops. That's yes. not, that doesn't say like Renee, stop podcasting. It's just like, wow, maybe you need to prep like a few extra minutes. Maybe you need sure. to do some breath work, like get your, you know, in the right mindset. Um, so I learned a lot. Obviously there's a lot, I think there's a lot of cons with that device. And I think you're, you know, the bugs, so I know you're fixing them. Yeah. Um, and I love your tagline of breathe better and stress less. Mm -hmm. I think the world's going to be a much happier place if we can achieve that. Um, yeah, I think I, I would, I would agree with that. And you know, yeah. it's, uh, one of the things that I try to do, uh, or I we should say not do is, is bash other companies. You know, I think that there's been so many good companies that have made great devices, have had amazing conceptual frameworks, but you know, in, in the end there, there are a couple of things that we have been told by our user and those who want to use Hanu is that for them, they want two different things. They want to know when they're stressed and what is causing the stress. So like, what are those things that are really like adding up? Because a lot of times, like we can kind of notice it in the moment, but then we have a really poor short-term memory, right? It's like, we just forget about it and then move on. But what you can do with Hanu, which is very different than any other app out there is when we find, or we alert you that your stress response is being a little bit more activated than as is as normal. You can actually log what we call life events. So you can actually track what the potential event is. Maybe it's email apnea. That's a huge one, right? So a lot of people will write, be writing an email and hold their breath. And, and it's actually these subconscious, like out of awareness breath holds that can actually tank our nervous system. And they're not great. Now, conscious breath holds can actually work really well to our favor, but subconscious actually is not great. I mean, it's really the body acting as a protective mechanism and the stress response starts to go crazy high. So you can log things like that. A lot of people commutes, like commutes are the worst, right? Like, especially when you live in a really positive populous city. And like, you know, you leave work at, you know, five, five 30. And the next thing, you know, like it should take you 10 minutes to get home and it's taking you 45 minutes to an hour. People's nervous system goes crazy. You got people honking, shooting the bird, whatever it may be. So you have the ability to log that. So I think that's a really important thing is to be able to look back over time, over the past day, past week, past month, or even year and say, what are those things that are really like my triggers? Like, what are the things that really cause some significant stress in my life? And I think just visually seeing it helps us to better prepare for it so that when we're in that commute, we're like, yeah, this is what normally gets me. I'm, I probably should Here do some comes. breath work. I mean, <laughs> yep. I probably yeah. should do some breath work right now. I, I think that's a huge differentiator between what we do and others. Yeah. So what are some of the things that people should be mindful of if they do see their HRV drop? Like we know exercise in the short term is going to drop it. Eating, mm -hmm. like what are the normal things to not freak out about if we see a drop? Yeah. Great question. And this comes back to how sensitive HRV is and how it can be confounded by like so many things. So a big one. Yes. Talking. So as soon as you start talking, um, there's a lot of different reasons why this happens, but we know that breathing is the major regulator of heart rate. Um, so heart rate is interconnected with breathing. When we're talking, we tend not to breathe um, as succinctly and as clearly as we might. And actually, when we're talking, we tend to breathe from our mouth more. So every time that I go to you know, take a breath, it's a lot easier for me to take a mouth breath right now than it is a nasal breath. And now that you know, everybody's honed in on that, they're probably listening. They're like, huh, yeah, you're right. I hear him taking those mouth breaths. And that can dysregulate HRV. Mouth breather. Pretty heavy. Oh mouth, my God, mouth, we're mouth. all mouth breathers if we talk. All a bunch of mouth breathers. <laughs> James Nestor just going to get on us. Watch out. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big one. Um, there's nothing like that's not inherently bad though. Right. I mean, it's, we all are going to talk We're human beings. We're socially connected. Like it's a really good part of, you know, who we are as humans, but what it could mean though. And I've talked a lot with my co-host on Hanu about this, Patrick McCune, who wrote oxygen advantage is an amazing breathwork guy. And he said like, you know, is his job was to like talk all day. Like that's what he does. He either is writing or he's talking. So what it means is, is like, if he's at a conference and he's talking all day, then for him, he really devotes a lot of time to being specifically nasal only breathing after he's done with his talking gigs and really practicing some breath work practices, whether it be, you know, slow paced breathing or some conscious breath holds, these can be really helpful in just resetting the nervous system. But do know, like, especially when you're wearing Hanu, the, if you 
are talking and your HRV goes down, it doesn't mean that you're stressed. It's just one of those variables that you can like be like, okay, that's nothing wrong. And if you log that with Hanu and you say like, yeah, my HRV was tanked because I was talking, then we won't like penalize you for that. So like in your stress resiliency score, we're not going to say, oh yeah, because your HRV was down and you were talking, like we should take points away from how resilient to stress you are. No, same thing with exercise. Like when you exercise, like I was, uh, I took a picture and sent it to our CEO, Chris Holbrook today. I was doing like a pretty intense Metcon this morning. And it was, it was like heavy. Like I hadn't done one of those in a while. And uh, my HRV is typically like when I'm wearing honey, it's typically around like and during the daytime 65 to 75 ish is my natural range uh i looked at it when i was doing my exercise it was five five milliseconds so i i was it was crashed and i felt wow. it and my heart rate was up at like i mean it was probably like 150 ish or so and i looked down and i was like oh look at that that's fun uh but the funny <laughs> thing is yeah, <laughs> it's fun. like I know it's, that's awesome. As Most people are like, I'm about to have a heart attack. I know. And that's the thing. I've seen it so many times. Like I can just laugh at it. And then one of the things that was, I was like, oh, well, that's cool. Let's see how fast I can drop my heart rate. Let's see how fast I can raise my heart rate variability just with some control. And when your HRV is dropped to that low and your heart rate's that high, it takes a little bit of time to regulate it but not nearly as much time as you would think. But that's again, another example of like that, my heart rate being that high and my HRV being that, HRV being that low was a major stressor. So my body was being stressed, but we know that that of course is a hormetic stressor that's gonna help me to rebuild back bigger, faster, stronger. So it's one of those hits that we can take because it's actually gonna improve autonomic control down the road. Another one that you mentioned, Renee, is eating. So eating is another big one, very similar to talking, but because your gut, the third branch of the autonomic nervous system, your enteric nervous system, because of the immense amount of blood that's needed in order to uh, both metabolize and digest food, uh, your heart's going to beat faster. And then because your heart's beating faster, HRV is going to drop. Um, so your nervous system gets taxed, but not in a way that's like, uh oh, this is bad, like type of stress. It's not a distressor. Uh, this is just kind of the natural phenomenon that happens. So again, we can't always equate like a drop in HRV to quote unquote, like stress. And a lot of people will say like psychological stress, you can equate it to stress, like stress on physiology, stress on the nervous system, but it doesn't mean that it's detrimental or deleterious stress. So that's an, another big one. The other one that I would mention as well, that will reduce HRV. Um, and again, it's not, this is kind of a little bit more of a controversial one to say whether or not it's good or bad, but it would be other exogenous substances that you're taking in that are not food. So that is mainly liquid form. And I'm speaking mainly to caffeine. Um, so coffee is one that will do it. Tea, anything that has a high caffeine content will do it. Energy drinks. I mean, I don't know if anybody should be drinking those anyway, but it, huh? these, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say pass on that. But those about, obviously will. What about overhead. nicotine? Is nicotine yeah. in the same camp? Nicotine is in the same camp. Again, like there's going to be controversy depending on who you talk to as whether or not that is okay for the nervous system. So like, you know, nicotine's an interesting one, right? Because it enhances mental acuity, enhances cognition and awareness, but it drops HRV and it increases heart rate. Um, you know, aside of from the potential for addictiveness, uh, I won't say potential, I mean, it, it, nicotine can be very addictive, but however, if you use it appropriately, it can be a great nootropic, especially a temporary one with a really fast half-life. Um, again, is that a bad thing that it's exercising, you know, a little bit of you know, control over your nervous system? You know, I think it's up for debate. You should just expect it. And my, this is kind of me personally, I don't see it as like, oh man, like that's, that's actually like significantly affecting my nervous system. And I don't need to do it because of that. Like I throw it into the camp of like, you know, balance, like my approach to it. Like for me, I'm just someone who doesn't use nicotine every day. Um, I'll use it maybe like three times a week or so, like choose some Lucy gum or use some like prescriptions, uh, trokey, like it, it just, it just depends. So it's, you just have to watch out for, you know, if it's impacting, like, I kind of like look to see how it's impacting 
me over more longer term, right? So if it's impacting me transiently or acutely, then that's one thing. It's like, eh, I can kind of take the hit, if you will. Whereas like, if it starts to uh, be deleterious to my overall trends, so like basically if I'm taking in too much caffeine, too much nicotine, and I start to see like my actual baseline numbers change, my recovery is not as good, my nervous system's a little bit too taxed because I've had too much or I've had it too often, that's when I'll reassess, but kind of like these once every once in a while type things. And for me, like just to be transparent, I drink coffee every day. Like I drink at least one cup a day um, and it doesn't have a significant effect. But when I start drinking two cups a day or even more than that, which I rarely do, then it can really impact heart rate variability. But I always still continue to marry that with like, how do I feel? Like, how do I subjectively self-report feel because that really does matter because if i know a substance like is going to then you know change physiology i then say well okay like that's that's fine but how do i feel with that and for me it's like past two cups of coffee hrv gets pretty rocked and i start to feel jittery and i start to feel a little bit like on edge and so for me i'm like okay cut off limit like my objective data and my self report data are kind of marrying each other right now that's when i really know okay like whatever i'm doing like i should probably make a switch or a change and, and that's just, that's everybody's own personal journey, right? Like you just kind of have to run those experiments yourself, but that's why we created Hanu. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So <laughs> the tracking is reminding me of sort of the feedback from a CGM where you're getting the real time feedback. So you can see exactly that moment where we get an uptrend or a downtrend. And yeah. so you can liken it back to that event where with overnight data, I feel like we consciously go to, oh, sleep hygiene, or, you know, am I going to do that hard workout or not do it, but not modulating everything in between. Uh, and I have a question about the self-reporting. I want to make sure I understood this right. If you put something in like talking a lot, is it going to not count against you if you reported it similar to like the CGM, it, at least with levels, if you put in an intense workout, it's like, oh, okay, we'll back off. We're not going to yeah. grade you so poorly this time. <laughs> Exactly. So what was what's funny is that we're friends with the guys at Levels and the gals at Levels, and we really like a lot of what they've done within their model and framework. So for us, uh, we have done a lot to kind of incorporate. So we have you know this composite aggregate score that is stress resiliency, and that's kind of like you know uh, synonymous with like the readiness score for Aura or like you know Whoop score, you know, or or Levels score. It's very synonymous with that. the The key difference to ours is is that yes. So like if you include some self-reported information, like you were exercising or you just ate or you just got done talking, what we're going to do is two things. Number one, we're going to actually ask you like what you were doing. So we call that a life event, but then also too, you can self-report like during that time, like, were you talking, but were you talking in a meeting where like you had like some, you know, individuals that you were, I don't know, trying to impress, or maybe it was just kind of like a more contentious meeting because that's a talking plus like you were actually stressed. So rate it there. And then we kind of give you this sliding scale zero to 10. And then kind of from your both your biometric data and then from your self rating, we include that into our algorithm to change or to modulate that score. The coolest thing I think about this stress resiliency score is that it modulates all day long. So, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you get your aura readiness score, or you get your whoop score, it's there. It's for your day. Like that's your score levels a little bit different, but for like the other, those other wearables, like it's there for your day. Hey, sorry, you got a 60 today. You know, a really crappy night. Deal with uh, it. Yeah. Good, yeah, deal good with day. it. Good luck. Good luck. Whereas <laughs> Try again <our> tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, which is kind of fun in one sense because you can gamify, but in another sense, it's just like, really? Like, is this really like how ready I am all day? So, what, anyway, I could go into such a soapbox. But that's why, you know, we did the modulating stress resiliency score. So it goes up and down depending on self uh, report, multiple biometrics, and then also the quantity and efficacy of the training that you do. So biofeedback or breath work or meditation, the more you do that and the more that you engage in those practices and report that it's working for you and also uh, have data or biometric change, it increases your score or decreases accordingly, not training. Training always is going to increase that score, but throughout your day, um, you know, it can modulate back and forth depending on your self-report and depending on your biometrics that we're, we're capturing. Mm -hmm. um, so follow-up question real quick, the self-reporting with the algorithms that you guys have created, is that determining you stress versus distress? You guys yeah. are kind of determining, okay, that's a good stress. Yes. More yeah. points here. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what we're actually trying to capture, yeah, is is use stress versus distress. And the we can't differentiate those with biometrics alone. Now, there are potential ways of doing it. Um, it's just a little bit riskier, and we don't want to make any assumptions just yet. What we're going to be doing and what we'll have integrated, and this is kind of something that most tech wearables are going to follow as well, or they're already doing is use things like AI and machine-based learning and other kind of mechanisms within the biometric, sorry, within the hardware and the wearable to detect and kind of better predict those things. So the really cool wave of this and what we really want to see in the future, and again, this is going to sound really futuristic and I'll be honest with you, we're not there yet, but this is where we will be, is that we want to be able to predict just based on, it could be context, time of day, and changes, subtle changes in your biometrics predict when the body's kind of revving up and getting into, a, into more of an enhanced stress response well before you even know it and well before it would like detect it now. And the reason being is because we know that for many individuals, especially people who tend to be a little bit more stressed and emotionally reactive when they're stressed, these individuals uh, can fly off the cuff really, really fast. And I've seen this, you know, in the workplace and, and with I've consulted, I've seen it in family members, like it just happens. But we're saying like, what if we can reduce the amount of times that happens by kind of just alerting people prior to things revving up a little bit more than what they normally do and say, oh man, is, is this maybe a good time to kind of just take like a short break? just like to engage in some breath work. Um, and if we can reduce, you know, percentage wise, you know, 10, 20, you know, 30% plus of that emotional reactivity and that kind of like volatility, then I think we're going to do a huge service for people. And I sure would love it. So and I'm kind of scratching my own itch oh, and yeah. learning it for me as well. Yeah. I Same. think the, fu the future of AI combining with all of this is is amazing. And it's, it's insane. I'm, I'm like more than halfway through Sergey Young's book. The, uh, uh -huh. I think it's science and technology of getting younger, some title, something like that. And he talks yeah. a lot about this and he says in the next 20 years, I mean, we're going to be like full Jetsons mode. And he starts <laughs> off the book it. by saying like, okay, imagine this, you wake up, it's your 150th birthday and you wake up and your, your bed does a full body scan. It does your HRV, your heart rate, your blood pressure. And it says, this is your risk of having a heart attack today or a stroke today. And then you get in the shower, you do a full ultrasound scan and it tells you this and this. I mean, it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It, it's abs it is absolutely coming. I mean, you even see like the wave of like sleep technology, like eight sleep and a lot of the other like biometric right. sensing beds, like it's, it's, it's happening. And it's like, it's one of those things where <clears throat> for me, like as a technologist, as a scientist, I'm really excited, but then I'm also like weary as well. Right. Cause like, it's like, you like get yeah. really, I get really pumped up about it and like, oh man, that's really cool. Like, especially like if we're truly like changing healthcare, if we're like really helping people to be more preventative and let them live more fulfilled lives. But I'm also like, man, could this like backfire on us? And, and I, I don't know, um, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm like, there's the potential for me of like thinking like, huh, in what ways could this like maybe potentially lead us astray and disconnect us from like nature and disconnect us from like other things that maybe our ancestors were connected to? I don't know. And we, I know we could get into a tangent on that, so I won't take us down I, that road. I mean, it's trip, definitely but. an ethical dilemma like it is yeah. i mean all the data is great and all the information but could companies especially insurance companies use that data against us like right. we knew your hrv was bad 20 years ago now we're not going to insure you <laughs> right. or something like yeah. that life insurance is going up 100 grand a month watch out yeah. yeah certainly a lot of political ramifications there but i think also that's sort of our responsibility is practitioners and you as a clinician like we have to empower people to then correlate back to their in intuition and make sure we're not getting away from those basic practices. Like you have Absolutely. to learn from the data, like the machine is not going to do everything for you. If you're not creating behavioral change, and it sounds like with Hanu, we are, yes. that could be positive. We're, I think some of these devices are not really keeping that in the forecast. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, and again, I think that the solution for us and the answer to that is closed loop conditioning, right? It's closing the loop on data because, uh, you know, it's really easy nowadays. And I put easy in huge quotes. Um, it's really easy to provide data. I mean, everybody's giving you data, but if they're not giving you the practical, practical solutions, like step one through step 10, like in how to complete this, then uh, I just kind of question like why I use it in the first place, because you know, for me, it's really interesting because I've coached so many individuals in the past who have utilized like wearable technology and they find it really fascinating. They're super intrigued, like for the first few months. And then afterwards they're like, eh, I'm just kind of seeing the same data over and over again. And like, I guess like I can make some changes here, but I don't know exactly what to do. And I'm like, well, what if we created, especially in the stress realm, because it's such a huge problem. I mean, it's an immense market, immense problem that we see here. Like, what if we could actually create something that took them down, like the steps of like actually helping to repair their nervous system and learn better control over it? Because like for us, like the end goal is so that people can live more fulfilled lives Lives. Like they can be better moms, better dads, better brothers, better sisters, just like better coworkers, better human beings in general. And like, I know that, uh, you know, sounds maybe like a little bit cliche, but like, we just, I, I want that. Like people are really freaking stressed and like, it rubs me the wrong way when people are stressed. So I want to be less stressed <laughs> for other people. And I want other people to be less stressed for me too. Yeah. It comes full circle. With all it does. Yeah, we influence each other so much and stress is isolating and then it just has compounding effects. So oh, for sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Just bring it down. <laughs> indeed, um, indeed. Jay, curious about the HRV measurements. What um, is it RMS, SSD? Like what are you using? Mm -hmm. Like can people compare yeah. that number to other mm -hmm. devices? Yeah, yeah, you can. So one of the, so it's it, it, our main metric that we're utilizing that's going to be factored into the stress resiliency score. And the one that you can see throughout your day um, as it modulates is RMS SD. So RMS SD, just kind of a quick primer for people, uh, is the single greatest uh, short-term measurement of parasympathetic functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So we know that when someone is experiencing a pretty significant stress response and the vagal break is removed, that that RMS SD value will then decrease. Um, and as people, are experiencing more of a relaxation response, then that number will then increase when the vagal break is applied. And that's a very much an oversimplification. I think that, you know, the last podcast we did, we delved a little bit deeper into this and, you know, there's plenty of other podcasts where we go really deep on like that metric, but that's the primary one that we use, but different than other wearables. Um, you won't, you won't find this in aura. You won't find this in whoop. We get into all the advanced metrics, especially when people are training. So there is a field, a clinical field referred to as clinical biofeedback. Um, this is a well-known field within psychophysiology, um, mostly performed by psychologists, but can really be performed by anybody who has that specialized training. And biofeedback is an evidence-based practice uh, that helps people to become more aware of changes in the nervous system through training of breathing. So you're utilizing bio or your biology as a source of feedback. And there's different types of biofeedback. You know, there's temperature biofeedback, skin conductance, which is like sweating. There's EEG biofeedback, which is known as neurofeedback. So looking at brainwave states and changing brainwave states. And then another one that we use is heart rate variability biofeedback. And that's the training mechanism that we use at Hanu and maybe down the road, uh, hint, hint, uh, not anytime soon, because we still need to launch our first device, uh, but maybe down the road, we're going to have multi-modalities of, of training. So utilizing kind of different array of sensors, but we're focusing right now on heart rate variability, because when you look at the evidence uh, and the, and, and the range of literature, uh, it is the most um, profound use of biofeedback. Now, when you engage in biofeedback, we are going to use RMSSD as the primary value um, um, that we that we're looking at. So we're looking at change uh, from start to finish. Uh, we're looking at how high did RMS SD uh, go? What was the range throughout training? So we look at that. But then we also look at things like the frequency domain values of heart rate variability. And that's like if we were to shine all of the raw data all the inner beat intervals that we collect, like through a prism, we can actually look at the component values, um, just like you would if you take all the raw data from an EEG and if you throw it through a prism, which we call a fast Fourier transformation, it's just this very complex statistical equation, it will show the component values of brain rhythms. So, you know, alpha, beta, theta, delta, gamma. 
Uh, so we can do that with heart rate variability. When you're practicing biofeedback, these are actually really important because as you slow your breathing down, most of the power is actually pulled into what we call the respiratory sinus arrhythmia and baroreflex band or the low power band or low frequency power band. So when you're engaging in biofeedback, you actually want to enhance that amount of power in that range as much as possible. And so with Hanu, you'll get to see, like, did you pull a ton of power into that band? Because that would be actually indicative of a really strong parasympathetic response, a really strong engagement of the nervous system. And then, so we'll, we actually show all of these complex data st and, and statistical analyses. And for some people like, you know, the biohacking community, health optimization community, they're going to like fall in love with it. Like the other, you know, everyday individuals probably be like, ah, yeah, I don't know. Like, did this help me? Yes or no? Like it, am I stressed <laughs> now? Yes or no? Which is great. Just tell That's me fun. what to do. <laughs> exactly. And the good thing is, is that we're building this for both, right? Like we have the health optimizer and the biohacker in mind because that's the community that I'm a part of, that you guys are a part of, that we have a lot of our advisors a part of. Like it's one that it was an easy kind of in for us, but we want, so we wanted to build the complexity for those individuals to like be stoked and fall in love with. But we also wanted to build it for the person who's just like, I want something just that is going to simply like monitor stress and then help me fix it. Um, so that was my long winded way of saying that we're going to have a wide array of data and statistical analyses, but we always kind of package it with, here's what you should be looking for. And here's how it's going to add value. And you'll see how each of the components influences or increases your overall stress resiliency. So again, we make it super easy to understand and super practical so that you can see like, basically was training effective for me and training will always be effective for you no matter what even if your biometrics don't change or even if they go in a direction that you don't want them to go let's say heart rate variability decreases there are again so many confounding variables that can influence that we know though that simply changing like your respiratory rate regardless of whether or not it changed heart rate variability substantially influence things like respiratory sinus arrhythmia and heart rate fluctuations increased um, better home homeostasis of blood pressure and blood pressure mechanisms. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where like, I tell people like you always get rewarded within our app. If you engage in practice, because we know it's good for your physiology, regardless of whether or not you had these substantial swings in biometric data. Most people will experience a substantial change in biometric data. And this is where it's like, if you look at the literature, when people engage in biofeedback, like we're not seeing, you know, a lot of companies will tout like, you know, we can increase your HRV by like 10%, 15%. Uh, with biofeedback, we see people moving and shifting HRV within session 30, 40, 50, sometimes a hundred percent. So I, wow. I always say it's like, eh, the, for the win is biofeedback because, you know, if I hear someone saying like, we can change your HRV 10%, or I'm like, you know, you engaged in slow wave breathing right now, you can do that. Like you can kick 10% way out of here. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll crush it, especially the more you do it. So that's my sales wow. pitch. We can increase your HRV by 100%. No, I'm kidding. Don't, or your money don't back. on that one or your money back. <laughs> So from a user perspective on the device, the train now button, that's, that's the real solution, right? And that's all breath work. Yeah. So there's different types of trainings that we're going to be including within the application. So when we notice, so there's kind of like user initiated and then there's app initiated training. So app initiated trainings is when we actually find, uh, uh, we're kind of operating as a, that stress radar, say we, we should say Hanu, the device, the software when it identifies significant changes in your nervous system, then we'll initiate training. And the way we do it, which is dissimilar to LEAF, because again, holy, there's some annoyances with that uh, device because sometimes that joker would just go off and you couldn't shut it up. And then when you did shut it up, it would just start going off again. So we actually will Creates alert you stress. by saying, <laughs> right, it did. I mean, it did. We'll alert you and say, okay, we've noticed something. Now, are you ready to like engage in some training? And if not, like, we'll leave you alone. Like you go and do your own thing. Cause if you're in the mm. middle of talking right now, I don't want you to, this thing to be vibrating and buzzing on you the whole yeah, time. Right. You're going to be like, I'm doing a presentation right. yeah, in the middle exactly. of a podcast. Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> oh my goodness. It would happen to me all the time on podcasts. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so no, what we do is that we vibrate. So we use haptics, we vibrate and we say, okay, we notice that something's going on. 
are you ready to go? Like, do you want to do this? And they, and you can say yes or no. So you can tap it and then it can start a breath work practice. So the user, uh, sorry, the, um, um, uh, software initiated or Hanu initiated type of training is going to be based on resonance breathing. So one of the cool things that you can do when you first get our application set up, and you put the hardware on is that you can actually go through uh, the 100% validated true approach to finding your resonant frequency rate. So resonant frequency rate is the optimal breathing rate for enhancing nervous system control, which is then subsequently kind of represented by an increase in heart rate variability. So this was created by Dr. Paul Lair, who sits on our board. Um, and he is kind of like oversaw everything that we're doing in regards to this evaluation assessment. Um, it's a little bit more on the lengthy side. Um, and I say, lengthy side because I know that people nowadays have short attention spans. It's 12 minutes. So lengthy, but also well worth your 12 minutes. I know it's weird to say like lengthy nowadays, but people like, I'm sure people are gonna be like, eh, 12 minutes. Like I can't, I don't have time for that. Yeah. You got, you know, I was so good. I was about to cuss. Uh, I'm not going to do it. You've got, you know, two hours to go watch Netflix or whatever. You don't have 12 minutes. Right, to scroll like... on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So I, um, so you have the ability to do that. And then once we do find your resonant rate, we lock it into the application and that's the breath that we pace you on when we initiate and we say, Hey, we notice something's going on. However, when you press the train now button, which you were referring to, you have access to our library of trainings that we have developed and that we're developing right now by the time we release out to the public um you know, in, in the latter half of the summer we'll have a ton of different trainings but that's things like resonance breathing it's box breathing custom breathing engaging in what, what andrew huberman calls the physiological sigh which is a really cool form of breath work so we have all these different forms of breath work trainings and biofeedback and a lot of people are going to hear me say those two terms biofeedback and breath work, breath work and bio, uh, biofeedback is breath work with the technology. Biofeedback is breath work without it. Like that's, that's really what it is. Like when I say biofeedback, it just means that we're leveraging technology to monitor. That's, that's all. So yeah, it's a wide array. Uh, uh, the other thing that we're including a lot of too, and this comes from our advisor, Patrick McCune is a lot of oxygen advantage breath work trainings. Um, so he has, if anybody has read the book, oxygen advantage, if you haven't, everybody needs to read that book. It is phenomenal. Uh, we're including a lot of his trainings in there, which are really more intended to change the mechanics and uh, cadence and chemistry of breathing, and especially help to increase overall CO2 tolerance. So these are great training mechanisms. And you, you can look to see what it does to your physiology. It's really cool to kind of like watch the change and see heart rate variability and heart rate and all these other cool metrics change alongside your practice. So it's a, it's a lot common in the field of training. And, you know, we, we're going to have things specific to sleep, um, energizing breath work, which is kind of funny because energizing breath work is really intended to provide like the opposite type of biometric reaction that you would see with these more parasympathetically engaging type practices. But again, we're not going to like penalize you because, you know, you did more of a tumo style breathing, you enhance heart hot. rate, you start to be dropped. Yeah. If you do that, like you're going to see some significant changes that are, um, going to penalize you at other times. And I say penalize very loosely, but we won't do that. So anytime Teacher you engage in jail, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Anytime you engage in training, we're going to enhance your stress resiliency because that's the way that physiology actually works. Anytime you engage in breathwork practices, it inherently changes physiology. Oh, I'm so excited. Summer can't <laughs> yeah. come soon enough. I know, I know seriously. I know. Yeah. And it's funny because I've been able to watch and you guys actually too have been more privy to some of the evolution of what we're building in. And, you know, it's going to evolve over the years that we have this company. Uh, but you know, it's fun to like, now I'm fully like engaged in the app and playing with it and it's collecting all the data and I'm, and I'm able to analyze it and add stuff and like do trainings. You guys are, you guys are going to love it. It's going to be so, it's so cool. So exciting. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Um, I have a random question for you about daylight saving time. Um, so our mutual, our mutual friend, Molly, Molly McLaughlin, host of the sleep is a skill podcast. She sent me this like funny text message from a friend. Um, they said, I feel like sleep experts are never happy because Molly's been ranting about how potentially ending daylight savings could harm us because we're not following nature's rhythm and all that. So I'm curious, right. what are we going to see with HRV or what do we currently even see with falling back, springing forward. Do we see a drop or increase in HRV? Yeah. I love, I love that question. It's such an interesting debate to me because yeah. like, 
like uh, on paper, it's like, dude, I, I just want to like, you know, keep the daylight as long as I can. Like, I love it. But then I also get the argument of like, there's going to be times where we, you know, the sun doesn't come up until like 830 in the morning. And that could be disrupting, especially for like kids. And I'm like, oh, I kind of get it. Uh, like, I, I understand yeah. it. And so I just find that to be like, an extremely interesting topic of conversation. So we see different changes in HRV with circadian rhythm. And we also see it at different times of year changing. So we know that HRV for most people, their baseline HRV will actually drop a little bit in the winter months. And the reason being is because typically people are a little bit less active. Um, so they're not engaging in as much exercise. And that's a key variable to baseline HRV is cardiorespiratory fitness. So we see changes there. Um, the other variable that we tend to see is that people, when they're not getting enough vitamin D and not getting enough sun exposure, and they have a little bit more disruption of hormones, especially, you know, with vitamin D and with cortisol, that that can actually reduce uh, HRV as well. So winter time is one of them. Now with the whole clock change issue in relation to circadian rhythm, there's nothing to my knowledge, um, or at least I haven't seen anything in regards to like nervous system functioning and those changes, like with, with the change in time, but I do have anecdotal like stories and experiences, which I find fascinating. I find that with the change of time, it's generally like about a week in the springtime when we go forward and we lose an hour that that hour takes typically like for a lot of people that I've coached about a week for people to catch up from a nervous system baseline perspective, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. The opposite happens in the fall though, is like when people gain that extra hour, they actually increase their over overall heart rate variability. And, and that lasts for about a week until it returns to baseline. Now, these are pretty marginal changes. These are not significant changes. You know, we're talking about like maybe a couple milliseconds up or down, but it's just intriguing. So to be honest with you, I don't know, uh, like if I have a dog in the fight and I'm like, you know, we really should, you know, do one or the other, because I've kind of heard both stories. Like when I first heard it, heard it I was like, no, keep daylight savings time. I love it. Like no more changes the clock. Like that's the way to do it started hearing some other sides of the argument. I'm like, all right, I could be persuaded back. So yeah, it's just an yeah. interesting topic. It is. That's why I was curious. For so time, Molly's so. gung ho about like, we, we should not, we should keep the continued changes of the clock. Well, she doesn't agree with changing the clocks, both spring and fall, but she mm -hmm. also doesn't agree with keeping this. Cause like you said, it could potentially be eight 30 or nine o'clock in the morning with no sunlight. Right, that's going right. against so there's no solution well <laughs> to go back to well, it's like whatever <laughs> what is it not what's the opposite um that's like the so, normal time so yeah time? Like daylight yeah standard time so a daylight standard this time. is daylight savings time now and it's standard time so she thinks just standard time always and that's always. the natural with them okay and I, I could get that so no changing the clock just go back to the standard time like i could get that i just like i don't like I don't like leaving work at like five o'clock in the afternoon or so five 30. And it's like, I get home and it's dark because then I'm like, I don't like have a lot of desire to go outside and like, you know, get dirty, you know, like in doing yard work or like doing anything like that. Whereas like summertime, like when it's, you know, dark until eight 30 or so like I'll stay outside till like eight 30, nine, nine 30 sometimes. And so, yeah, yeah I, I, I yeah, I'm the fun. same way. Like I, we love pasta giada, like taking a walk after dinner. And during the yes. winter, I don't do it because it's really dark in this neighborhood. And yeah. so you think alternatively, oh, I would come inside and go to bed earlier, which I don't. I just end up watching TV. <laughs> so right. like, it doesn't really pay off to like yeah. follow the natural yeah, cues. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do that too. It's, it's, it's funny because like, I find myself, like I wind down a lot more like in the winter time. And that's good because like, I'll be, I'm really consistent with bedtime. Whereas like in the summer, I'm a little bit less consistent, but again, though, I'll get out and I'll walk and I'll trade that like over a little bit of inconsistency over bedtime in the summer. I'll trade that with just like a lot more activity. Like I prefer activity over the like stringent sleep times. Molly may kill me on that one. So if you're listening, Molly, sorry. Round table discussion we're gonna have to start this i love up. it oh, we love joke it. with molly we say sleep is not a skill we give her a hard time <laughs> <laughs> oh man you better watch out when you're sleeping she's gonna come after you oh watch gosh out. she's so love smart her. though she's a wealth yeah, of knowledge we love her yeah Indeed. oh dr j 
the time has come, which is so ah, sad. I have boo. like such FOMO when we have to Pre- wrap things up with you. Pre- Pre- round three. three. Let's round oh, three. Oh yeah, we're Let's ready. <laughs> we are ready. We just need to make this it. on a consistent basis because it's insane the amount of knowledge that you have. And we are oh, thanks. so excited about Hanu. So we do want to share Thank that you. with our audience. We want to wrap up with a final piece of advice. You've been here before, so. Uh, yes. <laughs> but maybe things have changed. What, what can you offer today? No, it's... It, I think that, you know, it's so funny because like things, things do change. Um, and I'm learning more and more every single day. Like, I feel like I'm learning something new where I'm like, oh crap, like I've been telling people something that maybe wasn't fully accurate and 100%. But I think like my biggest, like the biggest takeaway and practical piece of advice that I have for people is like, try to remove this notion of quote unquote, low HRV that I have low HRV. Uh, And again, you know, I'm going to beat the drum. Like I mentioned, like uh, earlier, and you mentioned too, I'm going to beat the drum probably, you know, for the next 10 years or so on this, if not more than that. But like, I think that if, when people get into the mindset of like, I have a low HRV, it actually causes them to have a lower HRV because they get Mm. stressed about it. Like it becomes something that they worry about. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had clientele who like, I have optimized everything, sleep, nutrition, exercise, my stress, but I still have a insert low HRV. And like, they're like anxious about it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, let's take a step back because like all this comes down to is a little bit of like misconception and myth. And that's okay. Like as long as we have the appropriate education, now you know that there's no such thing as a low HRV, unless you're comparing to yourself and it can be low, like, let's not get that, you know, misconstrued either. Like you can't have a low HRV compared to yourself. Uh, then like, if you get that down, then like, I think that eases people's anxiety about this and they stop worrying about it. And I tell people that if you come to the conclusion that I do not have a low HRV, and if you want the practical skill, it's all about autonomic control. It's all about teaching your nervous system how to obey your beck and command. Like if you can do that, like that you've really succeeded from a health optimization, from a longevity standpoint, like you're going to reap the benefit. Awesome. So great. Always good to hear that. Um, so Dr. J, can you share with everyone what is the deal with pre-ordering since it's coming out summertime? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to let me mention our pre-order. So pre-order right now. So we wanted to make this as accessible as we possibly could to people. So the device itself is going to be $299 if you buy it at the time of launch. However, our pre-order special is that we're going to sell it for 40% off. So right now, if you go onto our website, hanuhealth.com, you can buy the device for 180 bucks. So that's 40% off, like 180 bucks, like in the field of health tech, as you guys know, is like a crazy steal, but like, that's not all. It sounds like, you know, one of those infomercials. Um, oh, wait, there's we are more. Also- <laughs> wait, there's more. We're also giving away and we were only going to do this for the first 1000 customers, but however, we're going to like extend this out, especially to those who are ordering now. I'm going to give away a $150 gift box for free, just for pre-ordering. So that's going to include a lot of things from our advisors. So maybe you'll see some Keon products in there. Maybe you'll see some Oxygen Advantage stuff. Like I, I won't give it all away, but it's some really cool stuff. It's worth 150 bucks that we're just going to give away. And the other thing that we're raffling too, which is really cool, is a one-on-one coaching session with Ben Greenfield. So we will raffle that to one lucky winner out of the pre-order mix. And you'll get an hour long with Ben Greenfield, chill with him ask questions, or if you just want to, you know, shoot the shit for 60 minutes, <laughs> go for it. It's your hour. So that's what we're doing. The thing that I love about what we're doing, if I do say so myself, is that we're only, um, we're only asking people to put $29 down to save their spot. And that $29 to reserve their spot is fully refundable. So if the time comes, we're about to ship the product and we let you know, and we say, Hey, it's about to ship your way. We're about to take, you know, the rest of the money, the 151 bucks to equal $180. Like it, as long as that's cool with you, like we're going for it. But if not, like, you know, you can get a refund at any time. So we want to de-stress that situation for everybody. So just put a little bit of money down, reserve your spot. And then when the time comes 40% off, that's it. Great. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So we'll put the link for the pre-order in the show notes for today's episode. And then also, um, if you want to follow Dr. Jay Wiles on Instagram, also Hanu Health on Instagram, great stuff there. And the Hanu Health podcast, you said, I think it's been like four months. Awesome episodes. Definitely check him out there. 
And you can find Jay on the Ben Greenfield podcast every once in a while. That's for right. Some fun Man. banter. That's right. All the all the all the fun banter. Talking about my uh, my two favorite public enemy number ones who can't keep their mouth from being blue with all that <laughs> all the toxins and uh, you know fishbowl cleaners. Uh, you guys, such yeah, you're gonna people. catch the big C. <laughs> Watch uh -oh. out! Watch <laughs> out! Hey, we're fitness influencers now. We've really I made love it. it. Hey, you made it on there with Ben Greenfield. You both are, you know, all three of you are public enemy number one. So oh, you made it. You've made it. We did yes. with our nutrition degrees. Oh, oh <laughs> right. yes. My un quotes? unprecedented nutrition degree. <laughs> oh my gosh. You got a Whatever lot that means. Click yeah. bait. Man, people. Click yeah. bait. Jeez. Well, thank you for <laughs> all fun. your support. Dr. Dr. Jay. You're right. awesome. No, yes, I love, thank you I love so it. much. Yeah. Thanks guys for having me on. It's been a blast. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to everyone that tuned in today. We'll see you next time.